And the reason it's so fascinating is because it isn't what it appears to be at first glance. Bitcoin isn't money. The blockchain isn't a system of currency. It is a platform of trust. It's not a company. It's not a product. It's not a service you sign up for. It's not a currency. Currency is just the first application. It is the concept of decentralization applied to the human communication of value. Because what is money? NQ told us it's an illusion. It's imaginary. And the reason we don't grasp that is because it's so deeply embedded in our civilization. Money is one of the oldest technologies that humanity has. It precedes writing. How do we know that? The very first samples of writing we have are spreadsheets. <laughs> they are tallies and ledgers of debts owed. And money pre-existed that writing. You might even speculate that money had an oral tradition until it needed to invent a written tradition, so writing was created for it. In the history of money that now spans tens of thousands of years, there have been maybe five major changes. From pure barter exchange to the introduction of the first abstraction of value, shells, feathers, beads, nuts, stones, and then precious metals, and then paper money, and then plastic money, and now network money. Bitcoin introduces a platform on which you can run currency as an application on a network without any central points of control, a system completely decentralized like the internet itself. It is not money for the internet, but the internet of money. And what is money? Money is a language. Money is a linguistic abstraction. Money is a language that we use to communicate value to each other. Money simply allows us to express value, and that value may have economic consequences, but it also has other consequences. We use money to express and create social bonds and relationships and associations and to create organization bitcoin is the first system of money that is not controlled by any entity that is completely decentralized and what that does is it introduces the very same things that the internet brought to communication. If money is speech, if money is a language, and you disconnect it from all other media, and you make it pure speech, pure content, an internet content type, a protocol designation, money over IP, it completely separates it from all of these previous notions of nations, sovereign issuers, institutions that control. And so we go from institution-based money to network-based money. And of course, everyone will welcome this with open arms. Not a chance. What do you think they said the first time someone was presented with a gold depository certificate instead of a gold coin? They said, 
that's not money. <laughs> Go away. What do you think happened in 1950, the first time someone showed up at a motel and presented their diner's club membership card and said, I'll pay with this piece of paper? That's not money. Go away. And now we're on the verge of a new transformation of money. We're on the verge of creating the first completely global, completely borderless, completely decentralized, and completely open form of money. One where you can build applications, because this money is programmable. And you don't need to ask anyone's permission to launch an application any more than you need to ask permission to launch an application on the internet. And the only requirement to have a successful application on the internet of money is two interested participants. That is your market segment, and you have an application. And a million applications will flourish. When you push innovation to the edges of the network, when you remove the requirement for permission, what happens? Exponential explosion in innovation. The applications that could not be built on the old systems of money because they required permission, because they required a significantly large market segment, because they required adoption by many in order to be available at all, now, none of those requirements exist. Anyone in the world can download an application or use even a feature phone with text messaging and immediately acquire the same powers that institutions of banking have today. And when I say anyone, that's only scratching the surface. Because ironically enough, not only does Bitcoin and blockchain currency not recognize borders, it also does not recognize people. It doesn't matter if you are a person, or a refrigerator, or a self-driving car. Throughout the history of money, ownership of currency required personhood, either as an individual or as an association of individuals in a corporation. Bitcoin can be owned by machines. Bitcoin can be owned by software agents. Machines can pay each other. And that is not just about economic activity. It is the basis for market-based security systems. It is the basis for creating bonds of authentication between devices. It is the basis of new applications that have never been done before. Bitcoin and blockchain technology unifies the systems of money. Today we have systems of money for small payments, systems of money for large payments. We have systems of money for payments between individuals, we have systems of money for payments between companies, we have systems of money for payments between governments. Does that remind you of something? That's how communication used to be before the internet. We had systems of communication for pictures, systems of communication for letters, systems of communication for short distance and long distance, and the internet came and unified all of those. What the internet of money does is it creates a single network which can do a microtransaction to a giga transaction in seconds anywhere in the world for any participant without permission. <laughs>